Tonight's topic, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Now, as we said at the beginning, there's no shortage of opinions about Jesus, and I'm going to go through several. C.S. Lewis, some of you know C.S. Lewis, author of the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, probably the most famous of the Chronicles. And C.S. Lewis said this about Jesus, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. How about Gandhi? Gandhi said about Jesus, a man who was completely innocent, offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom of the world. It was a perfect act. That's Gandhi's opinion of Jesus. How about the Koran? The Koran. That they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them, and those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for of a surety they killed him not. The Koran. Albert Einstein had this to say, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. John Lennon of the Beatles said, I believe in God, but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky. I believe that what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. It's just that the translations have gone wrong. The Dalai Lama had this to say, Jesus Christ also lived previous lives, he said. So you see, he reached a high state either as a bodhisattva or as an enlightened person through Buddhist practice or something like that. Brad Pitt, the actor, in an interview with, US Mag with Us Magazine on why he turned away from his Southern Baptist upbringing, said, I didn't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seemed to me to be about ego. I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. Opinions like these have Raged for two millennia since Jesus walked the earth. No one stirs debate like Jesus. There were other Messiah figures during Jesus' time and, and since. But you don't hear debates about Simon of Paria. Circa 4 BC, a former slave of Herod the Great who rebelled and was killed by the Romans. Or Anthrogenes. Circa 3 B.C., a shepherd turned rebel. How about Menachem bin Judah, allegedly son of Judas of Galilee, who partook in a revolt against Agrippa II before being slain by a rival zealot leader? These and other would-be messiahs came and went, but Jesus endures. Why? Because, like temple guards testified, no one ever spoke the way this man does. And it's true. No one said the things that Jesus said or said them the way that he said them. Matthew 7, 28 and 29, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Of course he had authority. He was the living word of the living God. The outward revelation of the heart and mind of God expressed perfectly for us in the person of Jesus Christ. 
but not everyone recognized him. John said he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. John chapter 1, verse 10. And so it was that when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now you have to understand the context in which Jesus is asking this question. Caesarea Philippi was a, was a um, mixed pagan city of the Greeks, Romans, and Jews. Sitting at the crossroads of a major road about 40 miles north of the Sea of Galilee at the foot of Mount Hermon, the largest mountain in any direction for 500 miles. At the base of Mount Hermon was a temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus, who had brought peace to the region. He had brought peace to the Roman Empire and thus was called the Prince of Peace. Augustus was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. The Romans considered both of these men to be gods. Now we'll have more to say about that a little bit later. But Jesus takes them to this spot at the base of Mount Hermon where there's a temple dedicated to the Prince of Peace. And in that setting, he asked them, who do men say that I am? The disciples reply with the popular opinions of the day, not unlike the ones that we read just a few moments ago. Some say John the Baptist, the disciples said. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, Elijah was Israel's greatest prophet, along with Moses. So in calling Jesus Elijah, they were saying two things about him. Number one, he was as great as the greatest of the prophets, and two, he was the forerunner of the real Messiah. Malachi 4.5 gave the prophecy. See, I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. To this day, the Jews expect Elijah to come first before the Messiah comes. And that is why they leave an empty chair when they celebrate Passover. But those chairs remain empty because Jesus had said that John the Baptist was the Elijah who was to come first, meaning that he himself was the Messiah. To the Jewish mind, to call Jesus Elijah was the highest compliment and honor, but it didn't go far enough. You see, Jesus claimed to be more than Elijah more than Jeremiah. Another awaited forerunner of the Messiah. He claimed to be more than just one of the prophets. What did Jesus claim? Of himself, he said, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah had never made or would dare make such outrageous claims. If Jesus is not 
who he said he was. You cannot call him a good man, a great teacher, or even the prince of prophets. He would be barking mad, as Richard Dawkins put it, or demon-possessed. And there are plenty of people who held both opinions. Jesus' own family thought he was mad, thought he was a lunatic. When his family heard about this, reading from Mark chapter 3, verse 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Jesus' sense of mission, his urgent drive to minister, his failure to properly eat and sleep led his family to the conviction that he had lost his mind. They came from Nazareth to seize him and forcibly take him home. My friends, this could happen to you because if you insist on experiencing Jesus, your family members may think you're crazy. They may think that you have gone too far, that you've lost it. You see, some people don't understand all the fuss about Jesus. They're going to wonder why you have, why you have to be all weird uh, to be religious. You can believe what you want to believe and say a prayer when you're in trouble and put a couple of bucks in the plate, maybe even a 20. Uh, see your priest or whatever it is that you need to do to get in your brownie points with God. But why all this talk about being born again and allowing Jesus into your heart to make you a new creation? That's crazy talk. And it's been said that the average spiritual temperature in the church, and I would say in society, is so low that when a healthy person comes along, everyone thinks he or she has a fever. Just be religious like everybody else. Don't repent. Do good. Just don't be godly. Talk the talk, but... Don't walk the walk. If you insist on experiencing Jesus, your family members, friends, co-workers may think you're crazy. The teachers of the law thought Jesus was demon-possessed. Mark chapter 3, verse 22, And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons he is driving out demons. But the demons themselves had testified, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. If the devils recognize who Jesus is, why can't we? <laughs> the demons recognized who Jesus was because, you see, demons are simply fallen angels. At one time, they enjoyed the love and the fellowship of heaven, as did Lucifer, who later became Satan. They knew Jesus. They worshipped him. He was their commander. And so in their fallen state as demons in this world, when Jesus showed up to do battle with them, they recognized who he was but human beings cannot so we've got Jesus' family and we've got the teachers of the law how about a Gentile how about a Roman Pilate Pilate was curious and thought Jesus was innocent let's take a look at that turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 18 John chapter 18, verses 33 to 38. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? <laughs> Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Jesus had flipped the script. Pilate thought he was the one examining Jesus, but Jesus turns it around and he's the one examining Pilate. Is that your own idea, Jesus said? 
Or did someone talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. And with this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis of a charge against him. Pilate was curious about truth but, but didn't stick around for the answer. He, he was intrigued but not invested. He did a Google search but clicked off onto another site before downloading the program. Again, we can find plenty of pilots today. Those who say they're looking for truth but unwilling to stay around long enough to find it. Curious but not committed. Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. If you want to know the truth, listen to Jesus. Examine what he says closely and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Pilate's testimony that day was, I find no fault in him at all. Powerful testimony. Jesus is guiltless. He has committed no crime. He's a good guy. Millions of people agree with Pilate's testimony, but do they believe? Do they become disciples? Do they allow themselves to be changed by this innocent man? No. Pilate's response following his testimony was to wash his hands and absolve himself of any responsibility. Millions have done the same thing with Jesus. They follow in Pilate's steps. They have nothing bad to say about Jesus. He's a good guy, a great teacher, a humanitarian and a social justice champion. They find no fault in him at all, but that's as far as they go. They don't want the responsibility of belief because to believe is to be changed. To believe is to follow. To believe is to bow the knee and obey Jesus as Lord. This they will not do. So they intellectually wash their hands and give that responsibility to others. Do with him as you will. If you want to wash, worship him and follow him, that's your affair. I'm out. And I'll continue my Google search for truth elsewhere. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus asked his disciples. Some said a prophet. His family thought he was mad. The religious leaders thought he was demon-possessed. Pilate said he was innocent. But what about you? He asked, talking to the disciples. Who do you say I am? Now, the answer is important because Jesus knew his time was short. His days in flesh were numbered. Was there anyone who understood him? Was there anyone who had recognized him for who he was? Would there be anyone to carry on his work after he returned to the Father? If there were none who had grasped the truth, then the work of salvation was at risk. If there were some few who realized the truth, then his work was safe. Who do you say that I am? Peter finally answered. You are the Christ. The son of the living God. Now why did Peter answer that way? Remember we said earlier. Jesus is asking them this question at the base of Mount Hermon. In front of a pagan temple dedicated to Augustus Caesar, the Prince of Peace, 
And both he and his father, Julius, were considered by the Romans to be gods. Well, both of those men, by this time, were dead. Yet they were considered gods. Peter's answer reflects a rebuke to those pagan gods. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, and the son of the living God. Not a dead God like Julius and Augustus, but you are the real thing, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, Peter. And this is a lesson for us. In order for you to understand and believe who Jesus is, you have to understand that the Father reveals that to you. The Spirit is the one who gives you insight. Up to this point, you may have just assumed that Jesus was a good guy. But only the Spirit can come and help you to understand that he's more that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. So, the discovery of Jesus Christ must be a personal discovery. It must be your discovery. You've got to know him for yourself. Jesus made a personal sacrifice for your personal sins. It is right that he demands a personal verdict from you about who he is. It can't be hearsay. This is between you and him. Number two, to believe Jesus is who he said he was, it must be revealed to you by the Father. What has been revealed, what has been revealed to you about Jesus over the last Eight days. Is he crazy? Or is he the Christ? Is he good? Or is he God? And what does your verdict mean for your life when you sign off today? When the live stream is over? If you're hungry, will you eat the bread of life? If you're thirsty, will you drink the living water? If you're sick, will you come to the healer? If you're lost, will you follow the way? If you're tired, will you come to him and find rest? If you're grieving the death of a loved one tonight, will you receive the resurrection and the life? If you, like a sheep, have gone astray, will you follow the voice of the good shepherd? If you understand yourself to be a sinner, will you look to the cross and live? Who do you say I am? Your answer is important because, once again, time is short. Jesus is coming soon. And as the clock winds down, Jesus asks another important question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The time to decide is now. But before you do, There is something even more radical that you need to know. More radical than what Jesus said about himself is what he says about you. What Jesus says about you. He says, Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. Matthew 13, 46, you are the pearl of great price. John 15, verse 15, you are the friends of God. John 15, verse 16, you are the chosen of God. John chapter 1 and verse 12, you are a child of God. John chapter 15, verses 1 and 5, you are the branches of the true vine, a channel of his life. And Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you are Christ's witnesses. And tell me, what act of righteousness, what good deed, what offering, what sacrifice, what commandment kept, what perfection of character can we point to that makes us deserving of this identity in Christ? Not one thing. It's not what we expected or deserved 
like the woman caught in the act. We expected condemnation, but we received mercy. Like Zacchaeus, the crooked IRS man, we expected rejection, but we received acceptance. Like the Samaritan woman with a shameful past, we experienced to be shunned. We expected to be shunned, but we received living water and cleansing. Like Lazarus, the corpse, we expected to rot in our sins, too far gone for hope. But Jesus called us forth from spiritual death and took away our grave clothes. Because he went in the tomb at Passover, we can come out. And because he lives, so can we. We can face tomorrow. We can face COVID-19. All fear is gone. We know who holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. You remember some years Go now. Ted Williams. He was known as the golden voiced homeless man. He was found one day holding his sign by a freeway off ramp in Ohio. He was looking for a few bucks. He didn't know he'd be getting a whole new life. Someone pulled to the end of the freeway ramp who happened to be a radio executive. And he called Ted Williams over to his window. He saw the sign and he said, let me hear a sample of that golden voice. And Ted, though he had been out of the business for years and had fallen on very, very hard times, addicted to drugs, he immediately responded with that beautiful radio voice. And the man, the radio executive, offered him a job. Took him off the streets, cleaned him up, got him into rehab, and got him a beautiful, beautiful job. Ted Williams has written a biography about his life and his journey. But that day when he was standing by the freeway off-ramp holding his sign, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't know he'd be getting a whole new life. All he wanted was a cup of coffee. He, he, he wasn't expecting rehab. And that's our problem with Jesus. We, we want a cup of coffee, a jar, a job, a mate, a car, a degree, an apartment. We want our sports back. <laughs> Not transformation. Not rehab. And today, this is where it gets a little scary because maybe you started out on this journey and you were just looking for a little something extra to make your life bearable during this COVID shut-in. A little something to take the edge off the boredom of self-quarantining during the pandemic. A little something positive to to neutralize all the negative stuff going on around you. But if along the way you've found Jesus to be who he said he was, the eternal creator God, who speaks worlds into existence and is the living, breathing expression of the heart and mind of God, you've got to know that he wants something, he wants to do more than just a little something in your life. If Jesus is who he says he is, then if we allow him to come into our lives, he changes everything. Are you ready? Do you want more than a cup of coffee? You can have more. In fact, you can have life and life more abundantly, but it starts... It all starts with your answer to the most important question you'll ever be asked. Who do you say Jesus is? Not what your academy or Sabbath school or Sunday school teacher said. Not what your preacher or priest says. 
Not what your legalistic or liberal friends say. Not what Brad Pitt or Richard Dawkins says. But what do you say about Jesus? Is he a legend or a lunatic? A liar or the Lord? If he is Lord, then your response must be to follow him. To walk in his steps. And if you do, I assure you that he's not what you expect. But he's everything you hoped. If in your heart you can say with Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you are my savior and Lord. If you can say that tonight, then I invite you to come experience Jesus. I invite you to come along for the ride of your life, the experience of a lifetime, the adventure that you will never forget. Though I grew up in a Christian home, I began my adventure at about the age of 17. I was baptized at 10, but... I came to know Jesus personally as my Savior and Lord at around 17 years of age. I wanted to know Jesus for myself. I I, I wanted it to be more than just my mom and dad's religion and their faith. I I wanted faith of my own and I began to investigate. I began to to study the Bible. I began to read and, and to really seek him out. And you know what? He let me find him. (laughs) He was there all along. But he let me find him, and I found the joy of my life. And I've never looked back. I've, I've never been happier than following the Lord Jesus Christ. Has it been easy? No. Have there been challenges and disappointments along the way? You bet. Do I still have questions? Even some doubts? Yes. But none of it overcomes the reality of who he is and what he came to do in my life. And even though life is not fair, and even though bad things happen to good people, Yes, to God's people. The Lord Jesus has helped me to understand why things are the way they are and what he and the Father and the Holy Spirit have done to reverse the order, to right the wrong, to provide not a temporary fix, not a Band-Aid solution, but a permanent solution to the sin virus. I have accepted that solution And I have received not only salvation and forgiveness of sin, but joy, hope, peace, love, and a future that is certain and sure. I can't answer all of your questions. And I certainly can't promise you an easy road. Jesus didn't promise his followers an easy road either. But he said... Be of good courage, I have overcome the world. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's with you now. And he wants you to follow him. I'd like you to turn to that card that is on the um, website there. You can touch the tab. There's four opportunities here for you tonight, depending on how you're feeling. My next step today is... I enjoyed this journey, but I'm not ready to go farther. Pray for me. You've enjoyed the last several nights with us, but you're not prepared to go any further with Jesus right now, so you're just asking for prayer. You can check that box, and we will pray for you. Number two, I am ready to say 
that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're ready to acknowledge that he's more than just a good man or even the best man. He's more than a prophet. But you're ready to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If that's you, check that box. Number three, I am ready to say that Jesus is my Savior and Lord. So you're going to take it a step further, not just to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, but that he is your Savior and Lord. It has become personal to you. If that's you and you're making a personal decision tonight, you'll want to check box number three. And then lastly, I'm not ready for this journey to end. I want to go farther and follow Jesus wherever he leads. If you check that box, we have been talking about a further experience with Jesus. We call it Follow Jesus. That is our virtual classroom that we will begin very shortly, perhaps even within the week. But we can't start it. We can't open the classroom unless we have students. And that means you have to let us know that you are willing to enroll in the Follow Jesus class. And if that is your desire, you'll check that box at the end, and then you will give us your contact information. We need your email address because we're going to be emailing you a link on how to join the meetings. This will most likely be a, a Zoom-type meeting, okay? But we can't send you an invitation if we do not have your contact information. So you've got to let us know. If you're willing to go farther in this journey... And you want to follow Jesus, you want to join the Follow Jesus class, which will be a weekly uh, experience, um, perhaps on Tuesday nights, then we need your contact information. Would you do that for us? And if you're not watching on the rentonadventist.org slash Jesus page, you're watching on YouTube or some other platform, then just drop us an email at info at rentonadventist.org. Info at rentonadventist.org. Let us know. Give us your email. We will follow up with you. We've come now to the end. Who do you say Jesus is? You know what he says about you. He has called you by name. He loves you. And he wants you to be with him in his coming kingdom, which we all believe is much sooner than we first believed. Tonight, if you would make Jesus your Lord, I'd invite you to bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for this experience that we've had for the last eight nights. This is Easter Sunday, Lord, the day that even the world recognizes something special happened. Those of faith believe that you rose from the dead. And tonight, all around the world, even though there are plenty who would doubt the reality of that miracle, there is no body. There is no body. And that empty tomb means that we also will live. Those who put their trust in you, those who look and live, it's an act of faith, but not blind faith. It is faith that has substance and evidence. If we will look and live, you have promised to give us eternal life. And if there's anyone here tonight watching that wants to make Jesus their Lord and Savior and say, yes, I'm willing to look and live right now in the privacy of your home. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner afflicted with the sin virus. I understand from the Bible that all are afflicted with sin. 
and the wages of sin is death. But I also acknowledge that you promised that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I say yes to that gift. I ask for my sins to be forgiven. And what's more, I ask to be transformed, made into a new creature, born again, and to be set free from my grave clothes, those things that have held me back from you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior, and according to John chapter 1, verse 12, all who receive you receive power to become sons and daughters of God. I claim that promise tonight. I am yours, Lord. Thank you for being mine. In Jesus' name, amen. friends <clears throat> thank you again for staying with us through the step change and for joining us now again for the questions period uh, i hope you've been blessed uh, truly this is a powerful message and it's one that addresses us directly in the way jesus asked that question and so we're going to take some time now to ask the pastor some questions and again i invite you tonight if you have a question just post it online. If you're on rentonadventist.org slash Jesus at our live site location, put your question in there. Uh, ask for a friend. We'd love to bring the question to the pastor. Same thing on the YouTube channel or on the Facebook channel. We're there waiting to see what your questions will be. So we'll get started. Pastor, <clears throat> Jesus obviously asked this question of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? How do you say that Jesus is asking us that question today? Is he asking us that question today? I think he asks every generation the same question. We have to make a decision about Jesus. You're either going to reject him or you're going to accept his claims. Um, there's a lot of people, as we mentioned yeah. in the presentation, who are, are willing to... Uh, say that Jesus was, was good and, you know, we'd all be better off if we lived according to his teachings and a lot of things. But you, you really can't call someone good if they are a bald-faced liar, <laughs> you know. And, and, and think about this. Millions have been martyred because of their faith in Jesus. So that kind of takes away from any goodness that he taught or any goodness that he achieved um, through his miracles or through his teachings, if he was lying and, and millions have died as a result 
of a, a, a myth, a lie. So you really can't call Jesus good if he is telling uh, uh, a falsehood. Um, so you, you're confronted, each generation is confronted with what to do with Jesus. I'm either going to trust him as who he said he was, um, the Lord, God, or I'm not, and I'm going to reject him. Uh, but you really can't be neutral. And so that's how the question comes to us, and it comes to us um, in, poignantly this time of year because during Easter week, of course, those scenes leading up to the resurrection, um, his, his crucifixion, um, we're confronted with it again. Who, who is this man, Jesus? And uh, maybe a better question, where is he? <laughs> where is he? Because nobody has been found. Yeah, very good. Uh, Jesus said a lot of things about himself. I was looking through the text here in the questionnaire. He called himself a king, light of the world. He is the great I am. He is the door. He is the, uh, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. Many, many more metaphors than, over, than that. Uh, question for you, a personal one. Which one is your favorite metaphor of Jesus? Wow. Oh. <laughs> I got to think about that because so many of them mean so many things. Wow. Um, I am the resurrection and the life means a lot to me because I've, you know, I've, I've lost loved ones. Mm. And uh, the resurrection and the life, Jesus stating that, is, is the hope of our faith that death does not have the last word. Um, and so that one means a lot to me. The other one, uh, I'd have to say equally, is I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is exclusive. Let me, let me say this. This is not a politically correct thing to say because in, in our world, everything is equal. Jesus and Buddha and uh, Muhammad and, and, and other isms and New Age, everything is equal. One religion is good as another. Jesus is very clear that he is like no one else. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is exclusive. Does that mean that there isn't good in other faith systems? Of course not. Of course there's good. And does that mean that there aren't good people who follow those faith systems? Of course not. They are good people. All I'm saying is this. One day, there's going to be a cure for COVID-19. They're going to find it. And they're going to offer it. But I'm going to tell you what. You're going to go into the drugstore. And there's going to be a lot of other drugs on the shelf. There's going to be... Um, Stomach medications, there's going to be antacids, there's going to be headache medication, there's going to be uh, medications for ingrown toenails, there's going to be eye drops for dry eyes, right? There's going to be um, all manner of, of pills for all manner of things. And they work well for what they're designed to work for. But there's only one that'll be a cure for COVID-19. So... You can, if you want to, take Tylenol. If you want to, you can take Zantac. But those medications won't cure COVID-19. They may be good for something else, but not that. And all I'm saying is that Jesus is the one who says, I'm the solution to the sin virus. Other systems, they may have their place. But I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so that's one of my favorite declarations of Jesus. And it is exclusive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, we, we, you talked about it tonight that Jesus' own family thought he was mad at one point. They didn't like what he was doing. They wanted to, you know, correct him, save him from himself, perhaps. Um, 
So what encouragement would you have for someone who has been labeled or ostracized or even persecuted today for their love of Jesus? It's hard. Um, it is not easy to be rejected by anyone, let alone family. And um, if you are experiencing rejection um, for your faith, for your beliefs, understand two truths. Number one, um, Jesus will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He promises to be with you even if you are um, cast out from uh, your family or cut off. He also promises that no one has given up mother, father, sister, brother, um, who won't receive, he says, more in this life and in the life to come. What does that mean? It means that your family changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you become part of a universal family, a spiritual family that encircles the globe. And you have uh, family members who will love you and embrace you. Um, that is many, many times more than those that you have to give up in this life. I don't say that glibly, I don't say that easily. I haven't been rejected by my family. So if you have, I can't in good conscience pretend like I have. I know it's a tough road to go, but I also know that um, you would not be the first. And many, many, many hundreds of thousands of people have stood up for their faith in Christ because to them Jesus was the pearl of great price. He was uh, of even more worth to them because of what he did than even blood ties. And so sometimes you have to step away or step back sometimes from family, but that doesn't mean that you stop loving them. In fact, I think your love for them intensifies. You will be praying with all your heart and soul for their eyes to be open too for Jesus to penetrate their hearts and to make himself known to them because you want to see them saved, ultimately. So um, take courage. Jesus says he's overcome the world and he is with you. He hasn't abandoned you. Okay, thank you. We've got a question here. Good. Um, hmm. A Catholic and an SDA have accepted Jesus but where do we draw the line in the right acceptance of Jesus? Are these people married to each other or are they just two people who've accepted Jesus differently? I, I don't know. I guess it could be just <laughs> as an example perhaps of different faiths okay. and where do we draw the line? Right, between, right, right, uh, right. Listen, we started out this journey saying that this was not about religion. Yeah. It was about responding to the voice of Jesus. It was about starting over from scratch, taking out, as it were, a clean sheet of paper and examining what the scriptures have to say about who Jesus is and accepting him. If you accept Christ as a Catholic, as a Baptist, as a Methodist, as Episcopalian or Presbyterian or a Seventh-day Adventist Christian or a non-denominational Christian, the most important thing about that whole sentence is that you accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. You reached out for his salvation. You understood that salvation comes through faith alone, in Christ alone, and you reached out and you said yes to that. Whatever faith system you happen to be a part of, they will help nurture you in your journey with Christ. What you will have to decide going forward as you now become a follower of Jesus is, is the faith system that you're in following Jesus' teachings? And how closely are they following Jesus' teachings? And if you find in your own study now, in your own study and research, that, hmm, my faith system brought me, and I really appreciate that, but I see some, some other things, some, some truths that uh, I, I need to adhere to my own life, then you as a Christ follower, you need to follow that trail. Follow Jesus wherever he leads. And you may discover that your current faith system um, is not sufficient to take you further with Jesus. And then you'll make that decision. But the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. That's one thing that Jesus said. He said, I'm giving you another comforter 
and he will lead you into all truth. So you've got to trust him that he's going to do that. And at the end of the day, it won't be necessarily about what label you wear. Right. It's going to be about what you understand to be Christ's teachings and your adhering to those teachings as best you can and link up with a group that helps you follow Jesus as best you can. Very good. I got another good question here. If we pray for friends or family members that reject us and Jesus, is there a Bible verse or assurance that they will be saved? Or is it still up to that person to revive him and, there, and there's no assurance? Wow, okay, that's a good question. And let me, the, the second part of that question, read so, that again. So I think that the idea here is we're praying for a family member who has rejected Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, can they be saved because we're praying for them or okay. do they need to make that decision on their own still? And if they reject that, is there no assurance for I them? See. I that's see, That's how I understand it. Okay, let me make sure um, to clarify a couple of things. Number one, you... Your prayers cannot save somebody else. In other words, your faith for them or even your prayers for them can't save them against their will. Can't do it. It still will come down to their personal decision just like you've had to make. Now, can you still pray for them if they've rejected Jesus and, and you? Of course you can and as we said earlier this week, as long as there is breath, as long as there is life, there is hope. You may not be able to convince or to, um, you may not be the instrument that leads your family member to Christ. Sometimes family members are too close to each other, right? And it won't be you. It will be somebody else that the Lord puts in their path, a friend, a coworker, somebody else in their life and you don't know when they're going to have that encounter so you can't give up even if you've prayed for years and years and years and years and never seen any change you've seen hardness in their heart you can't give up because you don't know five minutes from now a person could have an encounter um the famous um george Mueller. George Mueller is famous for the orphanages that he built in London without ever asking for donations. He was a man of faith and a man of prayer. And he prayed earnestly for everything that he needed to run those orphanages. And God miraculously supplied his need. Well, George Mueller had friends who were not Christians. He prayed for at least one of them that I know of that he never saw converted to Christ, never saw make a decision to come to him. George Mueller went to his rest without having seen the answer to his prayers on behalf of this friend. What George Mueller doesn't know is that the friend he had prayed for all those years came to his burial and was converted to Christ. He won't know that until resurrection morning. But I say that as, in, as a word of encouragement to you, don't give up. Keep praying. The Lord loves your loved one more than you do. And he will do everything short of coercing or taking away the person's freedom to choose to make sure that they have every opportunity to respond to his love and to his um, appeal for salvation. So just keep going. You can't save them against their will, but you can pray for them. And if ultimately they reject all of God's appeals, um, they will harden their own heart toward him. Because what happens is, is that... Um, the more you reject Christ, the easier it becomes to reject him and the, uh, the more faint the voice of the Holy Spirit is um, until the person doesn't want to hear anymore. 
Um, and, and God has to honor that. He has to honor that. But as long as there's breath, you keep praying. You know, this reminds me, uh, we were studying in our, our Sabbath school lesson a few weeks ago about Daniel praying and how the angel said, you were praying and I was sent to help you. I was fighting against the king of Persia, right. but the prince of Persia, and, but because your prayers, Michael was sent to help me. And so we can see that prayers do have an impact. We should never feel that they don't have an impact, but God doesn't coerce anybody. That's right. But our prayers can enable him to work more actively even for someone. I've got, I know I have friends on the, on the line watching tonight who testify to the power of praying mothers. Yeah. Huh. And the fact that they were out there, they were in the streets, they were gang banging, um, far from God, but the prayers of a godly mother uh, prevailed. Yeah. And uh, some, of those, some of those men, some of those gang bangers are ministers of the gospel today. Amen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is maybe a little bit back to where we were a bit, a bit ago about Jesus asking for confirmation uh, of who we think he is. He said he was a king, but he also said his kingdom is not of this world. Yeah. So how, you know, what does that mean to us? Uh, how do we follow this king whose kingdom is not of this world? <laughs> it is a kingdom that is to come. Jesus in his, um, he's the king of the, of the now and the not yet. The now and the not yet. When Pilate asked him, are you a king then? He said, yes, I am. <laughs> but my kingdom is not of this world. Not yet. Pilot, you're in charge now, but there's coming a day. Yeah. And Jesus is, his kingdom is to come. Uh, one of the things that we'll study in our um, Follow Jesus classroom is the prophecies of, of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, uh, Daniel saw, or Nebuchadnezzar saw, and Daniel interpreted the whole history of the human family from his kingdom Babylon all the way to the end of time and the last part of the prophecy was a stone representing the kingdom of God that smashes the image representing earthly kingdoms and becoming a great mountain and Jesus will establish his kingdom we read about that kingdom in Revelation Jesus talked about the kingdom he says the kingdom is among you, meaning himself, and he demonstrated what that kingdom was going to be like when he healed the sick, when he raised the dead, when he cast out demons. He was showing us that his kingdom to come is going to be free of the injustices and of the effects of the sin virus that we see all around us that affect us today. And um, it is a kingdom of righteousness and love and truth, and it is a kingdom that we know is true, even though it's not yet, because of the resurrection. The resurrection validates the coming, the reality and the coming of the kingdom. And we believe, and even COVID-19 is a sign that his kingdom is coming. It's coming soon. Yeah, very good. Um, when, when, uh, when Peter said to Jesus, you are the Messiah, you know, you are the Christ. And Jesus said to him that this didn't come by any other means, but the Father revealed this to you. Um, can we not know about Jesus through our own discovery, through our own searching? What does it mean that uh, this does not come through flesh and blood? We, can, we, we certainly start the journey. Um, what we don't know sometimes is that uh, the prayers of others and the Holy Spirit has prompted us to start that journey. Yeah. And even if we start it, quote unquote, on our own, at some point Jesus meets us. We encounter him in the process of self-discovery. And it is a spiritual thing for you to realize that Jesus is God. Um, the Bible makes it clear. It says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Um, there is, well, it, it, it is a spiritual experience. And 
We enter into it by faith. Again, it's not blind. We have evidence. But it is a faith venture. And um, the Father, uh, he actually, we, we find out in our discovery, Brian, that it's not us who found God. It's God who found us. He, he was on the hunt for us long before we turned our attention to him. Um, that's the, the beauty of, of the gospel, is yeah. that God is the one reaching down to us, not the other way around. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, <clears throat> Jesus described his followers. I was looking at some of the texts that were here in the handout, and you know, he said to them, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. He says, you are like a merchant seeking a, a pearl of great price. Uh, you are my friends, he says. You are the branches, he is the vine. Uh, you are my sons and daughters. So these are interesting uh, descriptions of his followers. What is he saying to us that we uh, should not miss through these descriptions, through these ways of him? What's he trying to tell us through these words? That, number one, we matter in the kingdom of God. Okay. We have a role to play. We have a role to play. It's not that we are purely consumers of God's grace. See, in America, we're used to being consumers. What's in it for me? And I get the goodies. I get the benefits. But Jesus is saying, no, I have a role for you to play. I have a mission for you to accomplish as my follower. Yes, I'm going to load you down with benefits. You've got eternal life, forgiveness of sin. You've got the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all of those things, plus eternal life to come. That's all yours. But it's more than just for you. It's more than just consuming. You now become a disciple maker. You now become a conduit through which I'm going to flow my love and blessing to somebody else. You're going to become a first responder and help rescue other victims from the sin virus. And as such, you bearing my words and my testimony in your life will be light like me. You'll be the light of the world. You'll be the salt of the earth. You'll be preservative to keep the world from rotting around you. You are my friends. I share secrets with my friends. You're not just servants anymore. You and me, we're in this together. And the other things that he said, you're my child. Um, all of those things are to tell us and to communicate, you have a role in my kingdom and we get to do this together. Yeah, right, right. All right, Pastor, well, this is the, I guess this is near the, right, right, right at the end here. Um, what would you say, final message to our listeners tonight? <clears throat> Tell us about Follow Jesus 2020, and then we'll close, and we'll see who joins us for, for, for the next <laughs> phase. My final word to you tonight is um, you will never regret the decision to follow Jesus. And I don't want you to let the experience end. Um, I want to encourage you to follow farther. You know, early in the book of John, um, we see the first two disciples who come to Jesus after John the Baptist had identified him the day before as the Lamb of God. And these two uh, come up running behind Jesus. And the first recorded words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John are a question. And the question to these two disciples is, what do you want? <laughs> Who do you seek? What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, um, where are you staying? And Jesus responds and says, come and see. And that's where it begins. A simple invitation. Come and see. It's right here on our banners. Come and see. Don't let the experience end. D dig deeper. Don't, don't stop here. Jesus won't force himself on you. Uh, Sunday morning, again, um, Two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Resurrection Day. And a stranger comes up to them. And what are you guys talking about? 
And they look at him like he's crazy. It's like, what, are you the only man in Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened this weekend, these past few days? And the stranger plays dumb. What things? Come on now. Jesus of Nazareth, he was mighty in word and deed, and he did miracles, and, and, and we thought he was the one. But they crucified him, and our women amazed us this morning with a report that the tomb was empty, but... They didn't find him, and we don't know what to make of it. And the stranger says, oh, foolish, slow of heart to believe all the things that the prophets have have taught. And, And along the way, on this journey, I think it was seven miles, the stranger opens the scriptures and tells them all about Jesus, how he fulfilled all the prophecies. And when they get to their home, Jesus appears as if, or the stranger at this point to them, appears as if he's going to walk on. He's going to keep journeying. And and the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, they say, wait, 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 wait. Don't, 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 no, stay with us. Abide with us. Break bread with us. It's it's getting late. It's getting late. You You don't want to go on. We want you to stay. And the stranger agrees. And they sit down to eat and the stranger breaks the bread and he holds it up and he blesses it he asks the father to bless the the food and that gesture their eyes were open they recognized it that it's Jesus and of course they ran all the way back to town to tell the other disciples that they had seen the Lord but here's the point Jesus would have kept walking. They had to ask him to stay. You've got to ask him to stay. He's not going to force himself on you. It's up to you. So I pray tonight that you make the decision not to let the experience in, that you go farther with Jesus. Join the Follow Jesus virtual classroom. Let us hear from you. Give us your email address so that we can send you the link to the class information as to when it's going to start and what materials that you will need. You won't regret it. It will be um, the best decision that you can make. So either info at rentonadventist.org, let us know your interest and your contact information or on the Connect card tonight, express the same thing. We'd love to see you in the virtual classroom. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to experience Jesus. Thank you for these last eight days in which we've had a chance to see you with new eyes, to examine the record for itself, to take out a fresh sheet of paper and to rewrite the story as you told it without our baggage and preconceived ideas, our disappointments. And I pray that we have seen you more clearly and that there are some friends on the line tonight who've made the decision, I'm going to go farther. I don't want the experience to end. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And whether we believe in you or not, the fact of the matter is is that you still died You still rested in the tomb. You still rose for us. And you are risen indeed. Thank you for the opportunity to believe and to receive the gift of salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.